So today we have a guest speaker. So our speaker's name is Chaitin Surpur. He graduated from Monta Vista in 2008 and UC Berkeley in 2012 with a degree in electrical engineering and computer science. He's studying and working in artificial intelligence and he's here today to tell you about why studying the brain is important and how we can use it to build more intelligent machines. So give it up. Hi everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little fast. There's a lot to cover and not enough time. Uh, so, the, my talk today is gonna be about how we can understand the brain and how we can use that understanding to build truly intelligent machines. So the agenda for today is, our primary goal today is to get you uh, as excited about this field, about studying the brain, as I am. So I, I'm really fascinated by this field. Uh, really fascinated by this field. And I think that it's one of the coolest things that you can study and one of the coolest things you can work in. And my goal is, my primary goal is to get you as excited about, about it. Secondly, I'm going to give you a, no, not, I'm going to give you a <laughs> teaser. I want to give you a teaser on how the brain works. So uh, what we do understand about how the brain works, I want to give you some level of detail so that you can see that it's not magic, right? It seems like it's mysterious and magical, but at the end of the day, it's a, phys it's a simple set of rules governing how neurons fire. And if you understand that, you can understand how the brain works. And the last thing I want to do is give you next steps for how you can take, this, take these ideas, uh, learn more, and go do more with it. So the first is an unanswered question. Right? We're going to start with an unanswered question. You've seen, this is from Cirque du Soleil. If you've ever seen Cirque du Soleil or any circus performers, or professional sports, or even you just walking around trying to catch a ball, you, can, you should be able to appreciate how amazing it is that the human brain can do what it does, right? Uh, you have, it can react in a split second. It can do very complicated motions with, of course, with training. You have very complicated motions that if you were trying to program a computer to do the same thing, you'd find a really hard time, and people do find a very hard time doing so, right? But the brain is able to do it flawlessly. It's able to react to changing circumstances. Think about this. Every single moment of your life is something that your brain has never experienced before. The patterns of activity on your sensors, on your eyes, nose, ears, this is a pattern that your brain has never seen before, and yet it's able to react to that within splits of seconds and is able to do really remarkable things. So the question is how? How is your brain able to do this? Right? And that is the, the question that we try to answer that really pushes us to study the brain. So why study the brain? Right? That's a, the first question you want to ask with the, with the club like MV Neuroscience. We, study, we want to study the brain for, one, for two major reasons. One major reason is that we are our brains, right? My brain is talking to your brain right now. Our bodies are just hanging along for the ride. But in fact, it's our brains that are communicating. My brain is coming up with ideas, thinking of things, learning things, and communicating to you. And your brain is, un is hearing those things, understanding those things, and being intelligent, right? So we are our brains, and it's remarkable to think that we, our brains are just a bunch of neurons connected together and with electrical activity firing on them, right? And this physical set of neurons creates intelligence, right? And it's able to do so with just physical, simple physical rules. And your conscious experience, the way you perceive the world, the self that you have, the idea of you know, the, all the love, everything that you feel, is just comes down to physical neuronal firings, which is a really remarkable thing when you, when you think about it. Because that means when you, when we can, if we can understand how it works, we can understand how we work, how we're able to do all these things. And the second reason is that we want to build more powerful, if we can understand it, we can build more powerful versions of the brain, right? Because it's a physical system, you can create a, if you understand the principles, you can create another physical system that behaves as well or better than it. Let's start with what are brains. Brains, I'm going to uh, declare, right, is a, this is a state, this is a hypothesis. Brains are machines that create miniaturized models of the world, okay? So what that means is you experience the world, you live in the world, right? And the world is a bunch of patterns, right? Everything that's going on is just a bunch of patterns that your brain tries to understand and model for the main purpose of prediction. Your brain exists to create a model of the world, how the world works, in order to predict the future of the world to an extent, and thereby you're able to act on that prediction, on those predictions of the world. That is the purpose of the brain. It is a machine to create a miniaturized model of the world. And up till now, evolutionarily, they're the best machines to do so. We haven't found anything better, right? The brain exhibits so much intelligence, so much complicated, interesting behavior, that we have not been able to create machines or find any other kinds of machines that do the same kind of thing. 
Now, I want to make a note. I'm going to be talking about the neocortex, not the whole brain. So the brain is actually composed of multiple parts. There's stuff from the reptilian, when we were reptiles evolutionarily, there's parts from there where we, we can breathe autonomously, we can walk autonomously. But I'm talking specifically about the top part of your brain, the neocortex, which is a layer of, a sheet of neurons, a, a layered sheet of neurons that comprises, that is a seat of all higher level thoughts that we have. So all the complicated human things that you can do, that's your neocortex. My neocortex is talking to you right now. So let's look at some important properties of the neocortex. And the reason I want to talk about the neocortex and not the old brain, it's called the old brain, all the reptilian stuff, is because we, when we want to understand intelligence, we have to look at the neocortex. To understand what it means to be human, to have emotions, attention, all that stuff, that is all old, that's a lot of old brain stuff, but that you have to understand old brain stuff. But we are interested in intelligence, not what it means to be human. We want to create more intelligent machines. We don't necessarily want to create more human machines. Now, the neocortex. Some, a major property, one of the most interesting properties of the neocortex is that it's actually, if you look at it, it's just a sheet of neurons. They all, everywhere you look, it does vision, it does audio processing, it does sound, touch, all of in different parts of the neocortex, but they all look the same. They all look exactly the same. It's actually hard to distinguish between the different parts of the brain that's doing different processing because they all end up looking physically the same and they all behave pretty similarly. The only difference between the regions is what sensors they're connected to, so, right? So when you per perceive the world, you're getting a bunch of electrical signals coming in from your eyes and ears and nose and stuff. And those are going into your neocortex, and when they come to your neocortex, it just deals with them all homogeneously. All of those patterns, all it does is try to model those patterns. So if you look at it, it's homogeneous. Uh, sorry, I'm not supposed to say homogenous, my bad. Uh, it's uniform. Uh, it's plastic, which means you can you can learn to represent any pattern. So you can take your, the signals coming from your eyes and you can attach it to the part of your neocortex that normally does sound processing, right, that's connected to your ears, and over time that part will learn to see. And they've done experiments like this. So it can learn any type of pattern. And it's not restricted to the senses that you have, right? And it's hierarchical. Now we'll, we'll talk more about this, this part later. So, the single learning algorithm, that's a very important property of the neocortex that we have to understand. And it's very interesting when you think about it, that there's not a part of your brain that's designed to do audio or video or any of these different kinds of things that you do. Those just happen to be input sensors that you have on the world, and your brain, all its job is, is to model and predict the patterns of behavior that it sees. It doesn't matter what senses they come from. So a single learning algorithm, right? And this makes sense, considering how varied the things we have to learn are, right? We have to learn to drive cars, we have to learn what a banana is, we have to understand, you know, we have to learn how to study brains. These are all things that you were not born to do, right? You were not born with the ability to do these things, you had to learn to do these things. Which means your brain has to be able to learn to do anything, right? And that only works if there's a single learning algorithm. And this is very convenient for us, because if there's a single learning algorithm, and we, then we can hopefully learn to understand it, and we can implement it in non-organic matter, and we can learn to, we can create more powerful versions of the brain. Next. So one main point to understand is that the brain is a prediction machine. It exists primarily to predict the future. Now this is a strong statement to make, right? Because you see behavior, you see intelligent behavior. These are all things you wonder how can that come from prediction? And I'm going to make the statement that prediction is everything. Prediction is how your brain primarily operates. It exists to predict the future, and only by predicting the future will you be able to make decisions, will you be able to choose between options, right? So your brain exists to model the world, be in sync with the world. So what it means is, let's take, for, for instance, the, uh, the let's, let's do a thought experiment, right? Let's say you walk up to your door, your front door of your house, and you, open, you turn the knob and you open it. Every day you do this, at least once, you do it many times in your life, right? You learn to do this. This is something you can do almost without thinking. Now I can go in and I can change any one of a thousand properties about your door. I can make the handle uh, brass instead of silver. I can make it heavier. I can make the door creak a little. Any number of one of these things I can change. And you'll walk up to your door and the moment you start opening it, within a split second, you'll know there's something wrong. Now how can the brain do this? If, if it was a computer, if it worked like a computer computers do, it would have to check, constantly be checking against a thousand million different properties of your door. Right? It would have to see, oh, is it like this? Is it like this? But instead, the brain is not doing that. The brain, when you walk up to your door, you it, it's in sync with the current state of the world. It basically has a, a prediction of how it expects the door to behave, right? Because it's learned to do so, right? It's learned how the door behaves. So it has a, 
a prediction of how the door behaves to a certain, in a certain range, it expects the door to behave in a certain way. The moment that expectation is broken, it, um, it immediately, re something goes wrong in the brain, it, there's an anomaly and it recognizes something wrong. So constantly your brain is making expectations about how you perceive the world. That's the only way you're able to do things, right, physically. Physically, like for instance, motor control. You can only do things because you expect things to behave in a certain way. That's the purpose of the brain. So let's see how the brain represents knowledge, right? This is a little, now let's go into a little more detail of how the brain actually works. Let's say this is a layer of the neocortex. The brain represents knowledge with neurons. They're called sparse distributed representations. Distributed means that meaning is distributed over the neurons. Each neuron actually means something. It actually represents some meaning. So let's say look, you're looking at an apple, right? This neuron might represent something red. This neuron might represent something round, right? This neuron might represent something shiny. Each of these neurons actually represents meaning, and the combination of, of the active neurons represents the concept that you're looking at, all right? And sparse means that the best neurons represent the concept. So there's only few neurons active representing concept. Most neurons are quiet. Some neurons are active, and those neurons are the ones that best represent that concept, right? Because if all of them were active because everything slightly represented, there were each neuron slightly contributed to it, then you wouldn't be able to distinguish meaning. So only the, the best neurons that represent that concept are active. This is how the brain represents knowledge. Now, sequence memory is how the brain uses that knowledge to make predictions, right? The brain is, 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 is all about sequence memory. For instance, you can re recite the alphabet easily because you've seen the alphabet in order many times. But you find a very hard time reciting the alphabet backwards because you've never learned to do it backwards because you learn in sequence. You can see this in music. You can even see this if you think about it in vision and touch. These are all sequence memories. Things only make sense in order. Now, let's look at how sequence memory actually works with these sparse distributed representations. Let's say at time t, this is first order memory, okay? So at time t equals one, I'll describe what that means. You have an activation of neurons, right, representing a concept. Let's say the letter A. This is the letter A. At time t equals 2, you have a different activation of neurons. This represents B, because you're, let's say you're seeing them in, in order, right? And it's a different set of neurons, right, than A. Now, how does the brain learn the sequence AB? When B at, gets activated, it makes connections with all of the neurons that were just previously active, right? It forms a connection, a physical connection. And now, whenever A is active, then B can now predict its own activity because there's connections to the cells that were just previously active. That's how, when something happens, your brain can predict what's likely to happen next. That, but that's first order memory. It can only predict the very next thing. How can it predict variable order memory? Well, before we go into there, let's look at multiple predictions, right? So the brain, if you see AB, then AC, then AD, then when you see A, what comes next? It could be BC or D, right? So the brain actually makes multiple predictions. Remember when I said you walk up to your door, you open it? You actually make multiple predictions because it's never going to be the same twice, right, that your experience. But it's going to be around the same. So your brain makes a lot of predictions at simultaneously, and it can check whether what actually happened was one of those predictions. And it can do that very efficiently. Let's, so let's look at variable order memory, right? I ate an apple versus I bought eight bananas. Now when you hear these sentences, this, the sound eight is the same in both sentences, right? But well, you can tell the difference between the first eight and the second eight. It means something different to you. Why? Because of context, because of what came before it, right? I ate versus I bought eight. Even a child will understand the difference between the two. How that works is that if you look at it, the next slide. So in fact, the neocortex is a layer, is, is a, the re, a region is a layer of neurons. And each column represents some meaning, right? Like, Let's say each the column of activations represents an A, but what cell in the column, right, right, what row in the column for the for the sound eight and the second eight, the first eight and the second eight, the same column will be active because the sound eight is identical. You're hearing the same thing. But because the context is different, the eight actually means something different, which cell in the column is active is different. So the first eight might be the first cell, the second eight might be the second cell. At the end of the day, it's the same sound, but what context you're hearing it is, is different. And that's, rep that's basically represented in a, uh, in a columnar, columnal structure. That's how the brain does variable order memory. Now, I won't go too much more into this because I don't have time, but it's very fascinating and you can actually understand details of how this works. And I wish I could go into it more. But suffice to say that brain can understand lots of context, variable order context. Now, hierarchy is the last thing I want to talk about the brain. Hierarchy is very important, right? Because when you look at an apple, 
what your what your eyes are seeing are just lines and colors, right? There's neurons that are active that represent those lines and colors, but they don't see apple. They don't know what an apple is. They just represent the lowest level of the hierarchy. Now those neurons feed into higher level neurons that recognize these lower level patterns actually mean apple, right? And your brain can, those neurons understand what an apple is. And then those neurons can even represent the context of the apple, what, what context you're seeing the apple in, with the variable order memory I talked about earlier. And then there's higher level neurons that represent you know, more higher level concepts of apple. Maybe you're seeing it in a fruit basket, and that thing rep recognizes the entire fruit basket, combining all the information from the lower level hierarchies. So because the world is hierarchical, because concepts, the only way you can understand something is by understanding all the things that make up that thing, right? Your brain is hierarchical and represents knowledge in a hierarchy, right? And this actually uh, contributes to creativity. You get creativity because you can connect seemingly unrelated concepts because they're in a hierarchy. And uh, I'm going to stop there. I know it's not very clear, but I don't really have much time to go into it more, but it's definitely something you can understand by thinking about it more. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is artificial intelligence. Now this is my most, my favorite part of the studying the brain, because it's awesome to know how the brain works so we know how we work, but then you can take that knowledge and do something amazing with it. And what that is, is let's, let's look at how artificial intelligence works today. We need to create intelligent machines, right? Because it's not easy to program a car, to, a self-driving car, because the car is experiencing very novel circumstances every time, right? You can't, it's not easy to write a simple rule set. So you need the car to learn how to, drive, how to drive, right? You need to create a machine that can learn to drive a car. Current approaches are very problem specific. So when you, for instance, a chess playing AI, right, that you guys might have heard about, that is very good at playing chess, but it cannot play checkers, let alone drive a car, right? And a self-driving car knows nothing, knows nothing about chess, right? But our brains are able to learn anything, right? They're general learning machines. If you train it to play chess, it'll learn to play chess. If you train it to drive a car, it can drive a car. So if we can create better machines that are based on the human brain, right, we can have machines that can learn to solve any problem, right? And the cool thing about these machines is that they will be better than the brain in many different ways. They'll have, they could have higher capacity. Or we're limited by the physical size of our brains, but these things can be as big as we want them to be. They can, rep they can have enough, as much capacity for intelligence as you want to give them, right? They can be more durable, right? They can be literally immortal, intelligent machines because they, you know, they're not limited by organic material that's, that you're limited by. They can be in silicon. Uh, they can have more, you can attach more sensors to them. We're limited by our eyes, ears, touch, and things like that. We can't see ultrasound or, or, oh, we can't hear ultrasound, we can't see infrared, right? If we add these sensors to an artificial brain, it can learn to model that behavior, those patterns, just like we can, it can learn to model anything else, right? More sensors. Uh, we can give it more control. We're limited by our physical bodies with what we can do. But if you can give more control to an artificial brain, it can, it's able to do more things, right, with its body. So a human, so an artificial brain is a very powerful concept. If you think about it, imagine sending, imagine instead of trying to solve problems, right, specific problems. Let's say we want to solve, we want to solve cancer or hunger, world hunger. We can just create machines. We should be able to create brains and send them out into the field. Now, let's say we create two identical brains, right, that have learned nothing. We send one in neuros, one in uh, cancer research, and one in world politics. Right? These things can learn to, to learn to work in both fields. When they come back and they're experts in those fields, they're two totally different brains, even though they started out identically. This is a very powerful idea because that means you can create many identical machines and train them in different fields. Now, imagine connecting them all together, having them all learn in a hierarchy. And now these things can learn the, the connections between different unrelated fields as well. You can do all these amazing things with artificial brains that we can't do with humans. But that is, a, at the end of the day, how humans learn things, right? We all, you're all going to go and become neuroscientists and astronauts and actors, and you learn all these different fields, and you end up becoming, the, you're, you end up becoming an expert of that field, right? And, um, and you start out identically. So, Artificial brains should be able to do as much as humans do, but even more powerful and better. And finally, it would also be a good test of whether we understand the brain well enough to create a cop to create a better version of it. If we can create a better version of it, that means we at least understand how it works well enough to create a copy of it, right? And so, as a neuroscientist, uh, as neuroscientists, you should. Al it's also interest. Artificial intelligence is also interesting because it gives you a good test of whether you understand it well enough. 
Um, so the next steps, right? And, and the last thing is basically why solve problems, right? If we can build problem solving machines. That's the real promise of artificial intelligence. And brain inspired artificial intelligence is the next level to that. So the next steps for you guys, if you're interested, hopefully uh, this is exciting enough for you, right? Now you don't have to be neuroscientists or, or AI researchers, but you can definitely go out and learn more about how you work, right? How your brain works and what's happening in the field, right? Because it's going to be the next big thing. If you think about it, artificial intelligence, I believe, is going to be the next big technology. Just like the internet changed the world, right? Because of what people can do with it. Artificial intelligence, brain inspired artificial intelligence, if we have machines that can learn anything, right? That's going to fundamentally change the structure of the world. Just like, pretty much like how the internet did. It's going to be the best, best, next big technology, if you think about it, right? And I really believe that, and I think being up to date with this field is something that will benefit you for the rest of your lives. Uh, so the next step for you is, if you're interested, read on intelligence. That is the, by Jeff Hawkins. That is a book that inspired me. That is a it's a very easy to read layperson's book for details on how the brain works. The kind of stuff I talked about, he goes into much more detail, and you understand really how it works. You, you intuit it, and you can read it before bed. It's very easy to read. I love that book. Um, if you're interested in artificial intelligence, I, I encourage you to learn programming. That's a great way to start uh, in the field of AI. And there's a lot of great online classes. There's even some specifically like how to build a self-driving car. Uh, these are all online. They're all free. They're not exactly brain-inspired, but they're in the direction of AI, which is very interesting. Uh, join, I, I was a member of MV Robotics. And it was a great experience. If you're interested in AI, join MV Robotics. Uh, it's really, really fun, and it's a very rewarding experience. The last thing I want to encourage you to do is just, everyone can do this, just introspect. As you live your life, as you go about your day, as you go about being intelligent, making intelligent decisions, even just sitting here you guys are being intelligent, even though you're not doing anything physically, you're understanding what I'm saying, you're being intelligent. And you do these amazing things like catching a ball or playing tennis or whatever, think about how is your brain doing this? It's a very remarkable behavior that your brain is, is doing. Think about how is it doing this, right? Understand that there is a physical mechanism that is causing this intelligent behavior to occur, and something must be happening in your brain. Think, just wonder, how must it be doing this? And that is a question I think is a very interesting question that we, should, that we can all hope to we can all hope to try to answer. Um, I'd like to give some acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Jeff Hawkins and Dementa, which is a company that's working in brain-inspired artificial intelligence for most of these ideas uh, that I learned from, and even some of these slides are straight from Jeff Hawkins' slides. My email address is right there. Uh, please feel free to talk to me about this stuff. I really love talking about this stuff, and, uh, and I love talking about it with you guys. And I am now, hopefully there's some time for questions. But I hope that you guys understood some of it, and we're ho hopefully excited by some of it as well. Thank you. achieving AI to be able to implement the single learning algorithm in machines? Is that like the main challenge at the moment? That is, I think, the greatest challenge. There are many challenges. The, the main ch the main f purpose of AI is to create intelligent machines. It doesn't matter how we do it, right? Self-driving car is an intelligent machine, right? Even regular programs are intelligent machines. But the ultimate goal is to create the ultimate intelligent machine that is the brain, uh, or at least something like the brain, that can learn to do anything. And all you have to do is give enough training. Imagine if instead of having to write a, pro, a specific program, spend many years trying to, uh, you know, drive a car, if we can just throw in a, a just a typical prototypical brain at the problem and just show it how to do, you know, give it control over the car, and over time it just learns how to drive the car. It, and that's amazing, right? But in fact, you're you're doing that all the time. You guys all, if you learn to drive a car, that's how you did it, right? You weren't programmed to drive the car, and that is, I think, is the most powerful form of AI. And that's the sort of AI that we should be striving for. Yes. Hawking's book is online, right? It's, I think, I don't think it's free, but you can get it on Amazon, you can get ebook version of it. Okay. Um, yeah, and I really encourage you to, to read it. Everyone will understand it. It's written for pretty much anyone to understand. It's, there's not much, there's nothing technical in it. Yes. And uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your time.